Hello and a very, very warm welcome to you all. Thank you for joining uh, this event hosted by the Global Development Hub uh, on the subject, turning the world upside down again, global health in a time of pandemics, climate change and political turmoil. My name is Matthew Harris. I'm a clinical senior lecturer in public health medicine here at Imperial College in the Department of Primary Care and Public Health and innovation lead for the Applied Research Collaborative here in Northwest London. I want to very much thank the Global Development Hub for hosting and putting on this event, which I'm, I'm delighted to be part of. A word or two, first of all, about the Global Development Hub, if I may. It was launched last year uh, by Amina Mohammed, the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations and Chair of the United Nations Sustainable Development Group. And it creates collaborative platforms for multidisciplinary research, capacity building and knowledge exchange to support partnerships in lower income and at least developed countries. And it aims to support the building of equitable partnerships for research impact in a global development context. It offers a community building network focused on global development challenges, bringing together academia, government, policymakers, NGOs, civil society and industry. And it supports the college in capturing demand for sustainable development goal related education and global leadership in STEM education. So I very much want to thank the hub and Imperial College's international office for convening this event. Lord Nigel Crisp's 2010 book, Turning the World Upside Down, has been enormously influential. It was one of the first books for a UK audience to invite reflection on what we can learn from low and middle income countries to improve healthcare here at home. Because after decades long intervention, exporting our skills and expertise to resource poor settings, we begin to now realise the imperfections, fragilities and resource constraints in our own system. And we're better to learn about how to deal with resource constraints than from those settings. So we might, whilst we might enjoy the thing that exceptionalism gives us and that our system is considered by some to be a gold standard, there is in reality no such thing. Only the opportunity to improve and improve continuously, to learn and to learn from all places and all people. Nigel's first book influenced and continues to influence our research here at Imperial College, in particular in the Applied Research Collaborative, where we expressly seek out frugal healthcare innovations from low and middle income settings, research and promote their use in the NHS. And it has led us to research the entrenched biases and learned attitudes to healthcare in low and middle income countries. We've even embarked on a decolonization agenda in our own taught courses. The central premise of Nigel's book is to challenge asymmetrical power in global health by showcasing what can be learned from low income settings and from low income communities in our own country. So it's my great honor to help launch the second edition of his book, Turning the World Upside Down Again, where Nigel revisits that agenda in the context of new and unpredictable global political turmoil and advances new opportunities for us in the UK to learn from resource poor communities abroad and at home. It's a pleasure for me to introduce our speakers. Lord Nigel Crisp is the founder and co-chair of the UK All Party Parliamentary Group on Global Health, former chief executive of the NHS here in England and Permanent Secretary of the UK Department of, of Health from 2000 to 2006. He had previously been Chief Executive of the Oxford Radcliffe Hospital. He is an independent crossbench member of the House of Lords in the UK and works and writes mainly on global health pro bono in low middle income countries in Africa and Asia. He founded and chairs the global campaign on nursing, Nursing Now, and has written several books on global health including Health is Made at Home and Hospitals Are for Repairs. I'm delighted that we have two experts that will consider Nigel's book and offer some reflections on its key messages. Susanna Edjang is a global development, humanitarian, peace and security consultant with over 15 years experience in multilateral civil society and government organisations on three continents. She's co-founder of Collateral Benefits, a storytelling platform, that documents perspectives from Africans and Afro descendants about transcend transcending COVID-19, is a founding member of African diaspora platforms such as Afro Innova in Colombia 
and Africa 2.0 in Spain, and a member of the advisory board of the Collective for the Renewal of Africa in Senegal. Susanna is a 2014 Yale World Fellow and a 2024 Harvard MPA Mason Fellow. And delighted also that we're joined by Professor Francis Omaswa, who is the founding executive director of the African Centre for Global Health and Social Transformation, based in Kampala in Uganda, and Chancellor of Soroti University. He was the executive director of the Global Health Workforce Alliance at the WHO in Geneva, and Director General of Health Services in the Government of Uganda. He has a passion for access to quality healthcare for the poor and spent five years testing approaches for this at the rural Ngora Hospital in Uganda. He serves on several national, regional and global committees and is the publisher of the Africa Health Journal. So it's an illustrious panel to discuss this important topic. What we will do first is introduce is have Nigel introduce his book and some of the core concepts and we will invite you to please post any questions you may have along the way in the chat. Once we've also heard from Susanna and Francis considering the book, we'll be able to have a question and answer session with the panel. Nigel, please over to you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Matt. And let me add to your thanks to the Global Development Hub. Um, great in innovation that you're doing at the at the university. Um, and can I thank all three of you colleagues um, from all of whom I've learned a lot. Matt, I've learned from you on the frugal innovation things that you've been doing. Um, Susanna, I must of course say that in 2009 when I was writing the first edition, we were working together um, and I know that you influenced the, the, the ideas then and have influenced me subsequently. Uh, and Francis, um, what can I say about Francis? You'll see uh, hopefully you buy the book, you'll see in the index quite a few references to uh, to, to Francis Omazwa and some of the things that I have learnt um, from you. So really grateful for you joining uh, me in, in, in launching this book. As Matt has said, this is a follow up to the earlier book. Um, my publisher asked me to, to do it um, and I thought about it and then I realised how much had changed. And that first slide, pandemics, Climate change is real now, it was real before, but we know it's real now. And if you want political turmoil, there's plenty to go around. And we've got our own bit here in the UK, as uh, people in the UK will know about the voter conference in Boris Johnson yesterday. Um, so it's a different world. Um, and what I'm going to do is just pick out the six big themes in the book and just give a few practical examples. So let me start by the first two themes, which I'm hoping are going to come up if I press this. Um, uh, I'm failing to move it on. Here we go. Mutual learning. This is so two themes under this. Firstly, powerful high income countries can learn a great deal from people in lower income ones. And I've mentioned power because, as Matt said, a lot of this is about power. But and this is different from the last one. Professionals in any country can learn from their own poorer communities. Um, and I'll say a bit about both of those things. And then the second idea, of course, is that, as Matt has already said, when you combine the learning from all these countries and all parts of our communities, we can get real and sustainable progress. Now, the next slide, please. Again, I'm failing to move it on. So uh, what I say in the book is that actually what's different from last time, really, is we were quite optimistic in 2010 about things. We were some way through the Millennium Development Goals, we were looking forward to the Sustainable Development Goals and there was a positivity about global development and, and, and health. But actually so much has changed. And as a result, we have to rethink our ideas about global solidarity. And what I say in the book is, is not that actually you, you can't trust governments <laughs> and, you know, promises have been made that have not been kept. And of course, the pandemic and, and the inequity of vaccines around the world and, and so on will show that, you know, we shouldn't be naive about ideas about global solidarity, but that actually you can draw hope from the fact from the people I met writing this book and the first one and, and I'm often in contact with is how people around the world are joining together, are taking action, are tackling inequalities and prejudice. People all over the place and a lot of examples given in the book. Another thing that's different is that I also bring into the book a new ecological approach to health. And there are two bits to this, really. The first is that the health of the individual is intimately connected with the health of the community, the health of wider society and the health of the planet. 
and you can't think about a healthy individual without really thinking about the social context in the wider sense and the environmental sense. But also, I also explore in the book some of the ideas about health not just being um, a state of, um, uh, of social, uh, mental and physical well-being, but actually the ability to adapt to things happening to you, the ability to mend yourself, the ability to heal. Um, and we need to think of health in that sort of that slightly wider ecological aspect. And then if I may have the next slide, please. Uh, two further ideas, final ideas here, both not really in the first book. The first one is that it's really in, important to think about the causes of health here and not just the causes of disease. And the other book I re published recently, which you mentioned, Matt, was Health is Made at Home, Hospitals are for Repairs, which is a great statement. And the author of that statement, of course, is Francis Amazwa, uh, who used it when he was um, in uh, charge of the health system in, in, in Uganda. And it's a really important point that actually in terms of creating health, um, enabling people to be healthy, um, the roles are all outside the health disease system of the NHS and others. And then a final point, um, again, a, a really important point, which is actually we need to see health workers now as agents of change, not just doing the wonderful things you do clinically or in public health or wherever, but actually being agents of change who are guiding, influencing, informing and facilitating the public and everybody else across the whole range of health activities. Health workers are agents of change and custodians of knowledge. So those are the six big themes. Let me just be clear on the next slide, please, um, that there are big differences between low and high income countries, but there's a sort of parallel here. In low income countries, there's more disease, more poverty, less resources, powerlessness in international trade and wider relationships, and health systems are too weak and often can't deliver. In high income countries, bizarrely, we've got services designed for 20th century needs, high costs, incentives promote the status quo of power and hierarchy, and in many ways the systems get in the way. They force clinicians to do things they don't want to do, and people have to work, get things done despite the system. An interesting opposition, and people understand this. Next slide, please. This is a quote from a man in Ghana. The boy died of measles. We all know he could have been cured at the hospital, but the parents had no money. And so the boy died of slow and painful death, not of measles, but out of poverty. And a woman in the UK, I quote in the, in the book, and of course, things would have gone better if they'd listened to me. You know, the only person joining up her care was the woman. <laughs> the system was fragmented. And may I have the next slide as well, please. And people know what needs doing. Um, they know what needs doing in their own community, and this is where we need to start listening. We know what needs doing, what would welcome your help to do it, rather than development agents coming into a community in Uganda or anywhere and saying, this is how you sort yourself out. And a health visitor in Cornwall talking about communities know how to cure themselves. People actually get it, they understand it, and we need to listen to them. So a few examples before I, uh, I finish. So next slide, please. So learning from low income countries, I've got three groupings here that I've just pulled out um, uh, four groupings. sorry, breaking down the barriers between health, education and work, recognizing how health fits in with that wider context, working with communities and families, a mix of public sector, social and business enterprises, not this sort of barriers we put up here in this country and a big one training for the job and not just the profession. And let me just give you just a few examples on the next slide, please learning from low income countries. Um, so the first grouping here are about people who are doing things at a sort of community or social wide area. BRAC in Bangladesh, extraordinary organization. It's actually focused on supporting the ultra poor, um, but it provides a great deal of the health system in, in, in Bangladesh. And it starts off by empowering women. So it runs empowerment classes. It then actually helps them with health issues, it helps them look after their children and so on. Um, and it also enables them to get um, microfinance so that they can start businesses, earn some money. It then has set up shops and uh, and indeed a university and a whole range of things to provide support, totally integrating its health work into everything else. Or Mothers to Mothers in Southern Africa, in I think six countries in Southern Africa, it may be more now, where mentor mothers, mentor pregnant women who've got HIV, helping them to ensure that they don't pass it on to their children. Just an example of how 
in a very specific way, people within the community can support others with their health. Second group here, Aravind and Narayana in India, a lot of people, health professionals in the UK will know these two great examples. Aravind very is about eye care and Narayana uh, initially anyway, is very focused on, on, on heart surgery. Two wonderful examples of people using technology and systems in very different ways, breaking many of our rules, if you like, um, in terms of how we do things. And then the third area, uh, a couple of great examples here, one that Matt knows very well, um, community health workers in Brazil, very like the community health workers in Africa. Um, and now, courtesy of Matt actually, uh, and colleagues have been brought uh, to Westminster, to, to the borough of Westminster in London. Um, and we've now got a group of people working to the Brazilian model as community health workers within Westminster. And I think it's going to spread around the country. Or you can see the Tecnico de Sergia, excuse my pronunciation, in Mozambique, where you have nurses effectively doing obstetric surgery and doing it as effectively as physicians um, for something like a third of the cost. And of course, they stay in the country, whereas other people migrate. And then let me finish on the next slide, please. Learning from low income and minority communities. And we can see this in a whole range of different ways. And some of the examples I produce here are a, a great example from Falmouth in the south of England, um, where a group of professionals worked with local people on the issues the local people identified and made a whole series of changes across indices from um, postnatal uh, depression to children's achievement to school to reducing crime by working together, listening to what people wanted to do locally. Salford Dads, another great example, uh, a nurse realised that the unemployed men in Salford were an asset on a housing estate in, in, in Salford were an asset and not a problem and they've started to do a whole range of things in their community or in North America the Toronto Birth Centre set up by Indigenous peoples to provide a birth centre that fits with their culture and their system or the great Nuka health system in Alaska which is now spreading its way of working around the world. So we can learn from low income and minority communities and from uh, low income countries, provided, of course, we take off our NHS spectacles. And then the very far last slide, of course, is an advert for the book. So if I may have that and listening to this, you get a 20 percent discount if you put this code into um, uh, the, the uh, Routledge uh, uh, website. Uh, and that brings it up at about 18 pounds, I think, is what the book costs. Anyway, that's my advert. That's a very quick run through the big issues. Um, so let me hand it back to you, Matt. Nigel, thank you so much for the summary. Lots of uh, fascinating issues there around learning from communities within and without our, our own settings. But something there isn't there about sort of resource constraints and how we under resource constraints constraints can nonetheless innovate in extremely effective ways. Let me pass over. Thank you for that and for the plug. And if there's any merchandising opportunities, you must let us know, of course, as well. The, <laughs> with, let, let me with that pass over to Susanna. Susanna, very warm welcome to you. Please share with us some of your reflections on Nigel's work. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Matthew and everyone at the Imperial College Global Development Hub. What an amazing initiative. Um, I am. Um, this is an amazing introduction to Nigel's book. Yes, um, turning the world upside down again. And um, to me, this is a very important occasion. As Nigel mentioned <laughs> at the time when he wrote the first version, uh, edition of the book, we were working together um, and the world was very different. Um, you know, we he mentions also these things in the book, but I just will just uh, talk about them briefly because it, it is important, I think, uh, to understand a bit of context. So we had the eight million development goals, you know, global commitments, four of which were health related. And in 2015, you know, after the book was published, they will translate it into the 17 sustainable development goal, uh, goals. And, and only one is health related fully, but the rest of them, the other 16 SDGs are support um, these things. The, the important thing about this is that all countries, um, uh, all communities uh, have to contribute. Before it was only focused on 
um, mainly in the in developing countries, but now it was about identifying inequalities. Nigel has mentioned that, and in all communities. And that is what it is, uh, that's the heart of the matter, the heart of the challenge. We also have the Paris Agreement, um, and, but when, that we achieved um, successfully in 2015. But then what we have is that um, in terms of there is a tension between climate mitigation and climate adaptation, and the investment in the Green Climate Fund has never met the expectations of the commitments uh, that were made at the time. And we have gone through a few epidemics um, like Ebola in three West African countries out of the 17 that there are, uh, MERS in the Middle East and uh, outbreaks. And, but also what we have found in those contexts is that the visibility and leadership of local actors and diaspora response as well were very often difficult to recognize and, and, and share around. And then the other final issue to, that I think in terms of context that have changed is the migration and refugee situation. You know, we have around the world, one, um, around 4% of the world's population living outside their country, uh, different degrees of comp compulsion. Uh, refugees are different because they require international protection to, migra to migrate. Uh, but what we forget often uh, is that the majority of these movements are within developing regions. And, where, uh, and you know, in countries like Uganda, where Francis is, is where the largest settlements, uh, um, humanitarian camps are. So I think in the book, um, there is, um, uh, Nigel uses the, the, what is it, the big, um, the, the pyramid of hidden, uh, epidemics and, develop, and developing crisis no? that Chen and Anna Sinham uh, um, do. So it's like an iceberg at the top. We have all these uh, situations that we can see. So the epidemics and the, the problems. But at the bottom, there is these silent underlying structural problems, uh, which is like um, health systems, uh, which are unfit for purpose, whether because they have too much or because they have to lead them, as Nigel has mentioned before. Um, so the book, when you read the book, what do you think about taking the change in the global context? And the, a lot of the stories of people trying to solve um, um, health, uh, health, health problems sustainably. What the main, the main issue that I could address or understand is that it is one transversal issue that has to do with uh, how to find and scale up so sustainable solutions. Um, and that is um, inclusive leadership, no? It's the inclusive leadership of people at BRAC or the mothers to mothers, uh, or Arabind, um, or Falmouth, or, or Salford that. And it's also about how do you really scale that up or do does it have to be scaled up? So what I mean by inclusive leadership is about um, uh, it's about uh, who are going to be the people or organizations that are going to be leading change and, and how representative are they going to be of their real, of their context, yes, if we want really sustainable solutions. And, and inclusive leadership is, um, is something that uh, all these people in the book, uh, whose stories are highlighted in the book, uh, um, exhibit, you know. They are people that you know, espouse a visible commitment, um, are willing to uh, be held accountable and to hold others accountable. Um, they are humble in that they are, understand the limits of their capabilities and also and, uh, and understand that they need the participation of others to ensure solutions, are aware of their biases and, and have curiosity about others really. And there is, and they exhibit cultural intelligence and ability of effective uh, collaboration. Um, Nigel in the book uh, uses sentences to highlight main ideas throughout the book. And, and there are two that are very related to this idea of inclusive leadership, because it's the mindset. Yeah, it's like taking responsibility for, for the situation and trying to do something about it. One sentence that he uses is, we are only as strong as our weakest part, wherever that might be. Uh, so if our weakest part is the poorest community in a country or the poorest country in the world, 
uh, we are only as strong as our weakest part. And, and then the second sentence that uh, to me resonated as well is um, he says global interdependence in health goes far beyond our shared vulnerabilities. So it's also about, uh, yes, we share some vulnerabilities, but also do we share also the resources, we share vaccines? Uh, how can trade be made more equitable and fair? Um, and this also, of, of course, resonates with the Sustainable Development Goals and its motto of leaving no one behind. Um, when we also think about inclusive leadership, um, there, was, there, were, there are also a lot of voices of different groups within the book, but also of women. And I was thinking about the context in the world, no? about the role of women heads of state and mayors around the world in the COVID response, from New Zealand to, to Banjul in the Gambia, which have used more collective approaches in the way they plan their response. Although it may be too early to, to, to know or to judge um, the, the results, but uh, initial, uh, um, Initial reports are that they somehow managed to do something better, but um, the participation of women around the world is not uh, still equal. There is not um, gender equality. Not a single country has achieved gender equality. Um, in terms of political leadership, just at the level of parliamentarians, 75% of parliamentarians around the world are, are men. And we see, we see similar figures in also in the private sector. And, and if, if the, this lack of participation and engagement of women is uh, impacting on how we, we deliver for healthcare and development, what are we doing about it? Um, the other issue uh, with inclusive leadership is about, it's a, when we talk about women, we also talk about minority representation. And, and we have seen uh, in the last four years where Minority health workers have been able to spotlight, advocate, and lead action to address inequality in health results in terms of mortality and morbidity as a result of COVID-19 in the UK and other places, unfortunately, but also in, in poorer communities in developing countries. And the other issue in, in this context is that greater participation uh, leads to the identification of, of needs uh, so a new or previously overlooked needs to address problems, uh, which in turn um, take us to something that the book also talks about, which is the, is uh, the issue of data. Uh, who defines data? Who is sitting at the table when this happens? Who decides who and what is going to be counted? Um, in the book, um, the Nigel mentions Dr. Janet Smiley, a, can a Canadian leader in indigenous health. And her, and her colleges, which, um, like many others around the world, um, um, notice the disconnect and limitations of the current systems of data collection, management, and analysis with the communities whose data is being collected. Uh, and they call for communities to be central and involved in the data decision make, uh, make um, decision making process. Um, this way, um, we can prevent inequalities in healthcare, discrimination, and even sometimes racist uh, health policies. But it is like, what are we really doing about it? How the work that of people like Janet, Smiley, and others can be really mainstream and scale up. Um, in chapters 9, 10, and 11 of the book, uh, we have incredible examples of community leadership and practical knowledge from the Beacon Community Regeneration Partnership in Carbon, which is a place near Cornwall, where from 1995 to 2001, they were able to, by involving the community to reduce postnatal depression by 77%, which I think is amazing, and also to reduce child, uh, childhood accidents by 50%. Um, so is this um, type of work um, that I see in the book, uh, the call for action is how do you scale up? How do you value? How do you ensure that um, it's recognized beyond, uh, beyond um, their places? Um, but also I'm thinking about places like in uh, what, um, like Spain where migrant group, uh, migrant group established networks of support uh, for healthcare. 
um, what it is from collective savings so that people can um, uh, travel for healthcare visits or uh, hire someone to accompany them to uh, to advocate for them during healthcare visits uh, uh, or or where, uh, or where also they do they do advocate for collective healthcare and access. Um, so the point here is that without inclusive leadership, uh, we are not going to achieve the SDG on health or the WHO triple billion targets, no? which is uh, 1 billion more people benefiting from universal co health coverage, 1 billion more people better protected from health emergencies and 1 billion more people enjoying better health and well-being. And this is all in a context where our um, geopolitical context is also changing. No, um, uh, There is a growth in regionalism and protectionism versus globalization. And also there has been during the COVID-19 response a tension between decentralization and decentralization of services. So what does it mean this in terms of promoting greater collaboration and, 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 and learning from each other? Yeah, and all these um, of the themes in Nigel's book in terms of mutual learning, in terms of the demands for change, in, the, in creating health. How can we push for this when at the same time there is a push for uh, the um, atomization of of the of the global response or of the response for healthcare as well. So just to conclude, um, I think we are all here at this amazing event because we all care about global health. So the book really resonates with me. Made me, as you can see, made me think about many issues. Uh, but also um, things that I do in my daily life. And, you know, there are lots of examples that can resonate with you and that will challenge you as well, no? And we'll also raise questions for you. Um, there is a call to action in the uh, book, a, a call for a new approach, and, and which I believe that is even more relevant now that it was a decade ago when the first edition was launched. And, you know, uh, the, in the book, uh, you know, Nigel writes about what the future is about rights and human justice, not charity, which is what underpins the new approach, which is an approach which uh, values in independence. So this is this idea that health is something beyond the absence of disease or a feeling of well-being, but it's also about your independence and the reason, um, your ability to value your life, whatever um, you are, whether you're rich or poor or old or dying, disabled or not, yes? Um, well, it's also this issue about interdependence and mutuality, uh, whether uh, we value in healthcare the participation of different people, whether they are professionals as agents of change, but also people from the private sector, people from our communities, and, whether, and where are the women? You know, we understand where are the women and, my, and minorities in all this conversation about health, about collective health care. And then the is the belief on health as a basic human right. And, and this, I'm sorry. I'm, I, thank, thank you so much. My apologies for interrupting, but we need to leave a little bit of time, of course, for Francis to also contribute. But I want to say thank you so much okay. for your comments. You make some fabulous points around inclusive leadership role of women, minority groups, and of course, a, a much closer approximation between those in power and communities who really do know best in terms of what's right for them and what they need. So I want to thank you very, very much for, for your reflections on Nigel's book. They're very, very useful. We do already have quite a lot of excellent questions coming in on the chat, which I'm delighted to see, and we'll get to those shortly. Um, so Francis, can I, can I turn to you now? Um, for, for 10 minutes or so, just to leave some time for questions as well from, from, from the audience. Please do share with us your reflections on, on Nigel's work. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Matt, and thank you, Nigel, for uh, the presentation on the book. And uh, Susanna, nice to see you, long time. Yeah. Um, now, I will make, I think, three points. 
the first point is on the title of the book. And of course, to appreciate Nigel and his uh, publishers for uh, 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 producing this uh, again word in the title. But even more important is reference to uh, pandemics, climate change and political turmoil. It is extremely important that we recognize the threat which we as human beings or living things on the planet face from these three. Probably starting with climate change, which is the mother of pandemics. And followed then because of uncertainties, competition for resources and so on, leads to uh, populism, and uh, nationalism, hoarding vaccines, and all those type of things, which are actually existential threats to some, uh, to us as humans uh, and our planet. Now, regarding uh, the, the climate change is on, and we really must recognize that it is uh, going to be uh, a, a factor of how we behave, how we manage our things going into the future. Then followed by pandemics. I was a member of a commission at the uh, US Academy of Sciences some years ago, and we produced a report called uh, the, 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 um, the Neglected Dimension of Global Security, Infectious Diseases uh, Outbreaks. And the book, our report, opens with a quotation from Louis Pasteur, where he says, open quotes, gentlemen, it is the microbes who will have the last word, close inverted commas. And if we are not careful as humans, that is going to be our end. And we really must get our act together lest we perish. So your selection of the title of the book, Niger, is spot on. It is timely and it has to set us to think about how we will arrest the decline that is happening now uh, in our planet and in our communities. And then, of course, you talk about the, the rich and the poor uh, in the book. And, uh, and I was delighted to hear uh, uh, Matt Harris, uh, your, your, your institution there, you have uh, started a program on decolonization. But the, we need to reflect on the, the, the foundations for where we are now, the attitudes that we have, even how other people got rich and others either became poorer or uh, or, or remained poor. That's colonialism and what it has left behind. A slave trade, imbalance in power. And all those make some people think that they know better than others and make it difficult for them to uh, be able to appreciate what they can learn from mutually. So uh, that uh, 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 type of uh, uh, approach, like you have decolonization in your school, is very important to generate a new group of leaders who appreciate this background and recognize what its impact it is. And even you know those issues of balance of trade, uh, uh, our president here in Uganda quite often says, but who is the donor? We grow coffee. I think we are the third uh, biggest producers of coffee in the world. We send it all out. It comes back here, costing so much more. And so we, 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 he argues that we are actually the donors. And those imbalances all need to be uh, brought to the discussion. But then uh, how do we move forward from here as the book dis discusses? The book discusses uh, 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 some common denominators, our humanity, our empathy as, as, uh, as uh, human beings and social beings, the issues of rights uh, of uh, all people being recognized and respected. And I think the message of humanity is so powerful 
uh, because inside us as homo sapiens, we have that. You see someone sick or has had an accident, you don't know the people, you don't celebrate the fact that they are in bad shape. It touches you, you say sorry. So that, that uh, um, uh, trait in us needs to be cultivated more. The other one is also there, the one of greed. This is mine, go away. But it is the cohesive one, the empathic one, which has made us to come as far as we have come here. I was brought up by missionaries, the, the, the ones who educated me, people who left UK, Canada, where? Why were they coming to Uganda? I think those people were trying to go to heaven, you know, they believe in religion and so on. And, but it is in their hearts, it is in their attitude that these are God's people, let's help them. That is the humanity message. And I think the more uh, we build out of that, the better. And Nigel, you are two, two, now three books, uh, four books. You can include ours also we did together, African Health Leaders. We have to uh, generate a movement which works to action the beliefs that we have. Our friend Miriam Were has been asking for this uh, from us. And uh, it, 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 as I conclude, I will come back again to it. But I would like to, uh, since we talk so much about health, to applaud you for spearheading the new thinking on health. Health is made at home, we all know that. But do we practice it? Can we get health systems like uh, which concentrate on keeping healthy people healthy instead of waiting for them in the NHS hospitals when they are sick or our, our hospitals here in Uganda? We should have stopped them from seeking health care in the first place and enabled them where they live, where they work to create and maintain the health that they have. I think this is a powerful message in the book again, and we need to be looking for ways of popularizing it. Uh, so uh, my 10 minutes, I think I have got three more, uh, is uh, to applaud you the power of communities. In Uganda, uh, since COVID, I'm the chair of the National Community Engagement uh, Committee of the National Task Force, and that is how we've been able to keep uh, COVID at bay. Organized communities are very powerful, very powerful in finding their own solutions and sitting there listening to them uh, in, in the villages uh, just uplifts you. So the power of communities is something we should uh, 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 applaud in this book. Then what is the way forward then? What do we do? To me, I would like to uh, uh, advocate as the book does for institutions like Imperial College. I don't know who is on your uh, 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 sort of council or uh, international advisory board and so on. Uh, it, 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 we should have, uh, you should consider having people from all over the world in case you don't have, you probably do already. And other schools should do so, so that this uh, uh, learning from North and South uh, will be feasible. And then uh, students uh, rotations attachments of professionals also both to the north and the south. Uh, I quite often quote the example of Sir David Carter uh, who uh, was my uh, supervisor here in uh, Makerere uh, University. He, he was here for a period of two years. He went back to the, to, to the UK and became chief medical officer and I like to believe that his exposure here in Uganda contributed to that. And then it was also so nice, uh, uh, Matt, to hear you. Uh, and also in the book, the book emphasizes about multi-sector, bringing together people from engineering, bringing people from economics, bringing people from basic sciences uh, together uh, to run joint programs. And that way, uh, uh, this book uh, should uh, become uh, another opportunity uh, for the global community uh, to rethink how we can prevent the microbes from having the last word. And thank you, Nigel, uh, for, uh, uh, for putting it on the table once again. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Well, Francis, thank you so much for such profound and reflexive comments. I really, really appreciated those. I'm sure, Nigel, you did as well. I wonder, before we turn to some of the questions that have been posed by the audience, would you like a couple of moments, Nigel, just to come back to Francis and Susanna on some of their comments? Um, and any reflections you might have. We've got uh, several questions coming through the chat that I'd love to turn to. So, um, but first, do you have any any uh, responses? Let, let, let me. I mean, wonderful um, perspectives and, uh, and and comments and wisdom, as you say. Um, and I like uh, Francis. You you are so good with words. Climate change, the mother of pandemics. That's one that I suspect we will re we will remember. Sounds like a title of a book to me, but. Um, uh, However, um, two quick points, one, one, one on Su Susanna making lots of interesting points, but one of them that she really picked up on was this one of data governance, who owns the data? Um, you know, who owns what gets done? And, and I think that's that takes us back into this whole issue of power. And, and again, Francis, your comment on colonisation and the impact of colonisation about who gets listened to. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, who, who uh, that 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 is or who expects to be listened to as well actually you know that the long history behind all of that seemed to me to be really uh, really big points for, for for us to be thinking about but let's see the questions i think matt rather than my reflecting further thank you so much to all of you so um th there's there's a few questions here um th that are linked i would say and it's something around um early career researchers uh, um, healthcare workers and empowering them to be agents of change has been talked about a lot and also questions around how do early career research researchers begin to achieve this vision for global health how can we if you like um, begin to embed a new mindset in global health for the uh, for healthcare existing healthcare workers and those of the next generation Nigel do you have any reflections on what does success look like in terms of how to entrench a new mindset around global learning two, two, two very quick points then firstly this notion of agents of change which comes from a uh, a, a 2010 publication on the future uh, education of health professionals Lancet report people might like to look at it's heavily referenced in the book actually um, <clears throat> but it's about health workers as leaders and influencing others and you can't do it all yourself <laughs> you know you can be a specialist you can be a professional but if you're a single-handed psychiatrist in Bihar um, or actually if you're an overwhelmed GP in the UK um, part of your role is about Bihar engaging the temple engaging other people who can actually promote mental health and and you know leading GPs in the UK are doing this in their own communities creating health rather than just responding to need so you know that's the sort of notion and I think people do it and and, and actually what my, uh, Susanna mentioned that you know it's, it's a call for action and so did Francis actually um, and the last chapter I say actually just do something just get on with it you know what are you waiting for um, you know, are you that weak and powerless? You know, just do something that you believe needs doing. And I don't need to say that to the younger generation because they're going to do it. And I don't just mean um, complain or whatever or shout, but but actually do something. And actually, a point that I make is reach out to people you don't normally reach out to. Um, a lot of the change that happened here was people crossing sectors, um, people they didn't know, people actually they weren't even sure they liked. <laughs> you know, and quite a lot of the community stuff is private and public sector and there's prejudice there. So there is a bit about doing stuff, reaching out to others and getting behind some of these sort of major changes, having internalised these sort of ideas in your in your mind. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nigel. So real, real key message there around just getting on and doing it is really important, particularly as we consider what seems to be like an important shift in the locus of power that's happening from professionals to communities, from experts to local people, um, from north to south and so forth. So some really important key messages there. Um, but of course, we're living, as mentioned in the book, um, in a very fractured political context. Um, do you think that this presents, one of the questions in the chat is, do you think this presents um, is a, a, an opportunity for more decentralised power to communities or is it generally damaging for global health? I think it's a huge threat, but it, it goes back to my point about how we need to think about global solidarity. 
I think there's enormous global solidarity. I think Zoom helps actually. But you know, I, Francis and I and Susanna and I have worked on, on things and, and numbers of others together across continents. Um, uh, uh, and many of your audience will be doing the same thing. And I, I think there is uh, enormous power in that, that comes from that. And if the centre is weak, <laughs> um, or if the centre is not capable of doing this, if at a country level they're not capable of that, now of course we want a country level of solidarity and we need to push them to where we can push them within the democratic process, as it like. Um, but there's another point that, I, that, that, that relates to this, which is, um, I talk about the change makers in that last chapter. I just looked it up, <laughs> uh, and one of the quotations that I use is from a, a Dutchman called a Dutch doctor called Baz Blom, which is that when you're doing something, um, start small because you know it works, think big, and go fast. And it's fantastic advice because go fast, and then the buggers won't catch up with you. You know, <laughs> you, you, you you can keep moving, keep the momentum, keep keep going fast, and people do make change. Um, and I think we should be inspired, and I am inspired by by the people who do make change uh, and make things happen. Um, so there's opportunities there in in a in a dysfunctional society. But then you've got the great fear of what appears to be happening in China in terms of controlling the entire environment in which people live, uh, and indeed what we see in Russia. Um, so you know there's 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 that as uh, as well. But I don't know what the others think. Francis, um, would you like to go first? Do you think that the fractured geopolitical state that we're in is an opportunity or a crisis to bring us closer to the communities? Uh, Matt, it has probably to be both. <laughs> it is an opportunity uh, 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 in that it gives people like us I heard you, your earlier comments about uh, early career researchers and probably a lot of the people who are listening now are that type, young upcoming academics from uh, all over the world. And uh, to me, one of the ways in which uh, uh, we could turn this into an opportunity is what I was taught in uh, Thailand, what they call the triangle that moves mountains. You've probably heard about this. So basically one corner of the triangle is people like us, the researchers, knowledge generators. The other corner of the triangle is the people, the communities. And the third corner uh, is politics, politicians. And they say that if the knowledge generators have worked with the communities to identify solutions to their needs, then the third corner, the politicians, just become rubber stamps. Because if they don't follow what the people are asking for, no votes. So these issues should become those over which elections are lost and won, and we who are researchers, academics, and so on, really need to get together with the people. What are their needs of the communities? How can they be addressed? And then together with the solutions, we go to the politicians and say, if you want to govern us, if you want our votes, this is what you do. So a lot of the time we, the academics, the researchers, uh, we generate so much data, we use it for getting promotion, lecturer, senior lecturer, professor, and so on, and that data is there in the institutions and not being used to influence policy. That is, I think, the weakest point of academics and perhaps the majority of people listening. Can we, one by one, start to be the change agents that we are calling for? Thank you. Thank you. That is a, a, a significant uh, challenge you're proposing, so we welcome that. Thank you so much, Francis. Um, Susanna, I wanted to ask you one, one of the questions that has popped up in the chat is whether given, and we've only got a couple of minutes, so I'm, I'll ask you to be brief if possible, but it's a big question, unfortunately, but are the, um, is the Global North a reliable partner? Um, in future pandemics and crises, given what we've seen happen around vaccine nationalism and other things during COVID. 
Um, what, 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 what would you say to that? Um, um, I think uh, this is, there is, uh, is there such a thing as global north now? <laughs> you know, like uh, there, are, there are different countries in the global north that have behaved differently, some better than others in this issue of vaccine nationalism. So depends, it depends. Uh, Depends. I think uh, we have to think positively in the lines of what Nigel and Francis were talking about. And um, and yes, there are opportunities to to find to find solutions and, and to work with uh, with countries uh, in the global north that are uh, are willing to to find solutions that benefit everyone. Thank you so much. I mean, you touched on such an important issue that I think, Nigel, you speak about a lot in your book, which is language and, and how we must be very careful about the kind of language we use and terminologies and categorizations. And so, Susanna, when you talk about is there even a global north anymore, feels poignant and very on point as well around a levelling of um, be between different countries that is very important and will facilitate and be important for mutual learning. Um, so thank you for that, Susanna. Um, I'm conscious that we just have two minutes left of the session, which I feel has been extremely rich and vibrant and you've all provided such amazing insights into this important agenda. But can I invite you maybe just in, in the last two minutes in one sentence, um, if possible, um, what would you like to see to improve global learning and mutual learning between high income countries and low income countries? What one thing would you like to see happen in order to promote and support that? Suzanne, would you like to go first? I think uh, we have uh, in the lines of a start, a start small <laughs> and think big and move fast. I think it's just basic changes in how education, you know, and education and international education and global health education, that recognition uh, of global health uh, education um, in, in, different, in different countries as part of the curriculum. I think that will be extremely powerful going forward. Thank you, Susanna. Francis. Uh, let's create a movement, a small structure to start with, uh, 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 start small, move quick, think big, that quotation, Nigel, <laughs> let's make it happen. Wonderful, thank you. Nigel, last word to you, thank you. I hope the Global Hub will help, um, but um, very quickly, I mean, the big thing that I think is still really important here is professional education. Um, uh, you know, what happens inside the heads of um, the professionals is what happens in health. Um, so there really is a question of getting different approaches in, in there. I also love the point that Francis made earlier there about the Thailand Triangle, which I hadn't really thought about. It was a light bulb moment, um, Francis, is the educating the researchers talking with the people rather than what researchers too often do, which is talk to the politicians. You need to talk to the politicians too, but too often we try and influence the politicians when actually maybe it's the other way around. Thank you all very much. I mean, I found this extremely, extremely, um, uh, extremely enlightening and, and some mutual learning going on from my point of view anyway. <laughs> Indeed. Well, as chair of the event, I have to draw this to a close. Unfortunately, we're one minute over, but I just want to thank you all uh, for your contributions, Nigel in particular for, for this book, which is a fantastic re read and as all of your books are. And um, I very much urge you to procure the, the, the book if you haven't already. Nigel, thank you for sharing the discount link. Um, perhaps we'll be able to send that round to people as well, the attendees after this event. Um, so all that remains is for me to thank you, Susanna and Francis and Nigel for your participation today. It's been extremely rich. I hope um, to everybody who's watching that you got something out of it. Thank you for posting your questions. Um, and we will, I'm sure the Global Development Hub will be in contact with, with you in the future for similar events to this um, in the future. Thank, thank you all once again. Bye bye. Thank you.